America has a strange relationship with sex. We're obsessed with it, but it terrifies us. We censor it because it's constantly being shoved down our throats. But our dirty little secret is we like things shoved down our throats, especially when we're in bondage or we're wearing leather or being slapped around a little bit. And, oh, God. Mm. <clears throat> I'm Sunny Megatron. Join Ken Melvoinberg and I as we explore, dissect, and demystify American sex. Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, American Sex, with Ken Melvoin Berg and Sonny Megatron. Hey, psst, you. Me? No, the other person here with us, Ken. The listener. Yeah, the listener. Don't sound so disappointed. We love them. You, listener, I want to have a moment with you, just the both of us. Ken, you don't mind, do you? Yeah, go for it. Listener. I wanted to take a minute, just me and you, to have a little talk. And no, nothing's wrong. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you. That's it. Every week, without fail, you're here, waiting for a new episode every single Monday like clockwork. And you support us along the way, too. You are so dedicated to leaving comments for us on Facebook, sending tweets to at tag American Sex Pod. It's been just a little over two months that we've been together. And that's it. I know it seems like we've been together forever, doesn't it? I know. August 9th was our very first date. And that's me and Ken's wedding anniversary, too. I uploaded episode one to iTunes in a frenzy so I wouldn't be late for our anniversary dinner. Isn't that sweet? And the three of us have been together ever since. In those two months, you have helped this little indie podcast, these two wacky middle-aged kids with absolutely no fucking clue what they're doing, speaking into $15 karaoke mics from Radio Shack. (laughs) Your loyal listening has somehow helped us create something magical. They said it was impossible, but you had faith, and it paid off. Did you know we hit number 20 on the U.S. sexuality iTunes charts a couple weeks ago? Yeah. We also hit number 15 in Italy and number 6 in Australia. And that's all because of you. Because you listen to us every week without fail. You subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and other platforms because you know a steady stream of new subscriptions is the number one way for us to rank in the charts. You also know the more you tell your friends about this amazing hour you have with us every single week, the more successful American Sex Podcast will be. And the further and quicker we will rise to the top, the quicker we can get rid of these pathetic, cheap little karaoke mics and give you the things you've only dreamed of. So you valued listener, go forth, do what you were called to do. Subscribe to American Sex on iTunes and get your friends to subscribe to and have them tell two friends and those friends tell two friends and so on and so on like the Fabergé organic shampoo commercial from the 80s. And before you know it, together, we will be a force to be reckoned with. And our hair, it will smell absolutely amazing. This is your duty. I bestow upon you because you are strong, you are loyal, and goddammit, people like you. You have been called to... Sonny. What? Uh, this is getting a little weird. Where, where did that music come from? I'm sorry, I'll turn it off. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got carried away. I, I get really excited about this this beautiful little thing we've created, Ken. But we have to get on with the show in our interview with Molina William Haas. All right, no time for the pre-jingle this time, Ken, okay? Lick my balls. <laughs> sex toy spotlight. Here it is. Go. This week in the sex toy spotlight, we are highlighting Velskin premium silicone. The Velskin family of products consists of dildos, cock rings, and penis extenders. Plus, they have things like cleaner and lubricant too. Velskin products are 100% premium silicone, body safe, phthalate free, hypoallergenic, and environmentally friendly. And they're vegan. Ooh, can we eat them? Can we make like kebabs, like veggie kebabs out of them? I'm not suggesting you eat them. They're just not made of meat. Okay. <laughs> But they're a meat replacement. Yes, they are. At least a sausage replacement. 
<laughs> well, we have Ann and Joy a Velskin Cockering and two Velskin Dildos. So we have the harness compatible Jesse. It's in a very pretty blue, like, swirly, pretty pattern. And it has a slightly curved head, which is perfect for G spots and P spots. And then we also have the larger, more realistic looking Wrangler. And that one is a Wrangler, let me tell you. So the cool thing about Velskin dildos is they're dual density. So what that means is they have a hard inner core and a soft premium silicone outer layer. So this is what makes them feel more realistic than a dildo made of just all one material. Check out all of the Velskin products at Castle Megastore. Dot com. And don't forget, you can get 20% off, as always, on all Velskin premium silicone products or almost anything you buy at Castle Megastore by using code SUNNY, that's S-U-N-N-Y, at checkout. Also remember, you need to enter our giveaway to win a Wonder O Wand valued at $125 and provided by Castle Megastore. So go to SunnyMegatron.com backslash wand giveaway and use the contest widget to enter. And there's no purchase necessary. We won't put you on any annoying mailing list. You're not going to get weird shit. None of that. We do giveaways every month simply because we want to thank you for being a friend. Thank you for being a friend and listening to our pervy podcast. So yeah, get on that fast. Entry period ends on Halloween, that's the 31st, and you can get additional entries each day, which means more chances for you to win, so the quicker you act, the more likely you will have your own Wonder O Wand. Also, Castle Megastore is giving away an Angela White flashlight and a signed copy of the adult film Angela Loves Women 3, signed by Angela Light and Abella Danger. Oh, dat ass. Giveaways run through the end of the month. You can find the online giveaway form at KesselMegastore.com or see the link to both giveaways in our show notes. I just have to say, Ken, every time we talk about Abella Danger, you're like, oh, you get on that. Have you, seen, wow, wow have you seen her ass? No. Because you, you're you like, need to watch more see porn. her ass. Or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Is she good? Yeah, she's hot. Okay, cool. Anyway, we need to get on with our conversation with Melina Williams-Haas, and I seriously cannot get enough of her brilliant brain and hearing about her amazing life, and that applies to, like, her everyday stuff she talks about, as well as her take on her 24-7 master-slave relationship, and, like, seriously, she could, Melina could sit there and tell me what she ate for breakfast, and I'd be like, oh my god, you're so brilliant, I love you, just keep talking. And speaking of Melina's stories, she told us an outrageously hilarious and raunchy weirdest sex I ever had story that's going to be going up later this week exclusively for our Patreon supporters. So to check that out and to learn how you can hear it and all of our other bonus material and get all the other perks that we give, go to patreon.com backslash American sex. Thank you, Patreon supporters. Yes, thank you. We and you. here we go. With us today, we have Melina Lee Williams Haas. Now, this delicate, trembling flower of submission is a New York City born and raised writer, actress, BDSM educator, storyteller, sobriety fiend since March 2007, and an award winning executive pervert. Owned and collared by renowned contemporary composer Georg Friedrich, I can't do the Friedrich. part, Friedrich Haas since 2013 and his wife since 2015. She serves as his beloved slave, submissive, wife, servant, and muse. February 2016 saw the groundbreaking piece about the relationship featured in the New York Times. Her opinion and viewpoints on issues of kink, leather, and BDSM are frequently sought after by news and information sources like the New York Times, HuffPo, Newsweek, Essence, Ebony, etc. She's also a frequent guest expert on Dan Savage's Savage Love Cast, Tristan Terramino's Sex Out Loud three times, and Margaret Cho's Monsters of Talk podcast. Exploring King since 93, active in the leather community since 96, and teaching since 98, she speaks internationally on these topics, and she's even spoken about kink at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Melina is also a leather title holder, International Miss Leather 2010 and San Francisco Leather 2009, and co-author of Toy Bag Guide, Taboo Play, an award-winning Playing Well with Others, your guide to discovering, exploring, and navigating the kink leather and bdsm communities both collaborations with fellow educator and amazing human being lee harrington she's also a professional stage performer since the age of as i thought i was gonna get through this without like my tongue going blah, blah, blah. 
Since the age of five, your credits include singing on the soundtrack for the movie The Wiz, and this I did not know, co-starring with Danny Bonaduce in the underground cult classic America's Deadliest Home Video, which is kind of awesome, <laughs> and your short film Impact won Cinekink's Best Experimental Film Award. Melina's latest performance piece is Hyena, a collaboration with her husband. And your blog is titled The Perverted Negress, which you can find at Melina.com with the tagline, it ain't just the hair that's kinky, which I totally love. And if listeners, you're also a fan of my TV show, Sex with Sunny Megatron on Showtime, Melina appeared on episode six in our segment on race play. And one more thing you have going on, Melina, is your upcoming documentary with your husband called The Artist and the Pervert. So, whoo, hi. That makes my life sound so cool. I was like. I was like, whoa, whoa, that's I, I, that's a cool person right there. And then I'm like, wait, it's just you. <laughs> but you're so cool. Yeah. Hey, you guys. Hi. So I'm, I'm really, really, uh, I've got to talk about something. She, there's a very specific thing Sonny wanted to talk about first, but I'm cock blocking her because I want to talk about my phobias. And there's three of them, and one of them applies to you indirectly. Wow. So the first one is scary nuns, like real nuns that are old and creepy, but not like sexy latex nuns. Uh, the second one is hammerhead sharks, because I actually got for real caught in a school of them and pissed myself in the middle of the ocean. And the third thing is that I'm really scared of, hyenas. And wow. I've been meaning to ask you about, because <laughs> I'm scared to listen to the music. I, I don't know what to do about it, but like, I'm scared. To, is there actual hyenas in it? Like, what, what the fuck about hyenas? Because I'm scared to death of hyenas. Well, that's that's hilarious. And, and apropos, the short version of the story is that hyena is about my going to rehab because I was a serious alcoholic, like serious, serious, serious alcoholic. And so I had to, like, so bad that I had to go to an inpatient rehab where they give you drugs so that you don't die of a seizure, which is a thing that happens if you recover cold turkey from alcohol, which they never tell you in high school. Like when they do those scared straight things, you're like, stay away from heroin kids. And you're like, okay, that makes sense. And then by the time we were teenagers, it was like crack is whack kids. And we're like, okay, sure. But then you go to a party and you drink beer and you mix your drinks and you learn that alcohol is okay. But then by the time I was, you know, pissing the bed every night, unable to function, and uh, going through withdrawal was actually something that could kill you. So I was in an inpatient rehab, and the first night that I was there, a hyena appeared from the floor, like from a huge protrusion that sort of grew out of the floor as I was laying in bed, shaking and sweating and, and feeling as though I were going to die. And she introduced herself to me and then explained that what we needed to do was to leave the rehab. And I, of course, thought I was having some sort of psychotic break. And then I thought maybe I was actually just insane. And then I said, well, of course, I've heard of, of DTs, but usually you hear about people seeing fluffy, you know, pink elephants and shit like that. At least that's what Disney sells you on. And then I realized that, no, whatever was going on, I was now friends with this hyena who was going to talk to me for the next undetermined period of time and discuss how I needed to actually just go and drink again. So that's the genesis of the tale. Jesus Christ, that's frightening. Yeah, it was pretty <laughs> bad. It was wow. pretty bad. Mostly because no one talks to you about how bad alcohol re withdrawal is, even with, with, with medication. And no one really talks about mental health in this way and, and what can happen to you. And and I wasn't sure what was going on. And I, I wasn't going to walk into my, my therapist's office in the morning and say, so I just had a six hour conversation with a hyena. And I mean, I could like smell it and I could hear it and, and all those things. The only thing I never did was touch it because I said, if I don't touch it, if I, if I reach out and touch it and it's not there, I'm going to lose my mind. If I reach out and touch it and it is there, I'm going to lose my mind. So whatever, there's no good outcome for me trying to touch it. So I never did. But, um, you know, everything else, like smelling it and, and hearing it and being aware of heat coming off of its body, like all of those tactile issues were, were very present. And she remained a companion with me for solidly for a good six to nine months and then sort of peripherally for another few months and then there was a whole sort of like what's happening why is this going on and depending on who you speak to um there are very many different reasons why people think that this happened some people are like well you know you just had a very vivid 
hallucination. And I spoke to a neuroscientist friend of mine who was fascinated by this and said, no, it doesn't sound like you had a psychotic break. There are no cold presenting issues. However, for a hallucination to be that vivid and that persistent is unusual. Uh, wow. but the, well, but you are very gifted. So of course your brain is going to be capable of magical feats of sustained uh, contact with something that may or may not be there. People who I know who do all sorts of sort of spiritual woo shit had mm-hmm. all sorts of really uncomforting things to say about what that meant. And I spoke to a friend of mine who's actually a rabbi and she gave me the answer that like I least expected. I thought she was going to, you know, she's very rational about it. And she said, well, you know, actually in our tradition, we do have a name for people who have experiences like what you had. They're actually called prophets. And that's what that's about. And I was Whoa. like, I want to hear that shit either. And she's like, yeah, I know you don't, but I'm just telling you. Um, and then I spoke to two different therapists who both said, oh, well, actually there are forms of gestalt therapy where we encourage our patients to deintegrate an aspect of themselves that they're trying to work on. Mm-hmm connect with it and then reintegrate it, which is what I actually wound up doing. I actually wound up after a year of visualizing beating it across the nose with a lead pipe or an oar or a chair or my fists or shoving it out of moving trains. Like I had all these ways in my, in my head, I was trying to destroy it. And I finally was visiting New York again and I came back home and I was on the cross down bus and I just had this voice constantly in my head. And I finally said, what the fuck? do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do? And And she said, I want you to love me. And I was like, I can't do that. I can't do that. And then that's when like the other shoe dropped. And I was like, Oh my God, I hate myself so much that I've created, you know, and this goes back to your fear. I, I found the one animal in the wild kingdom that human beings have managed to really never connect with or ever present in a flattering light. There's no cartoon character anywhere of a hyena that's sympathetic. You can find every other animals, ants, crickets, sharks, you know, lions, every predator, everyone has, has been represented. Fucking jellyfish, come on. But you will never see an, uh, an empathetic hyena character that I have found. Never, I've never seen one, and that feeds into my phobia about them. Yeah, and so I decided to to try to figure out. I did a bunch of research. I just sat down, and I went the scientific method, and I said, okay, what about hyenas? Why did I choose this animal? What reason was that for? And I don't even know about hyenas. And I came to find out that a lot of what we know is not accurate. They're not simply pure scavengers. They're actually very effective predators. They're the only land animal that can run their prey into the ground no other no other uh, top tier predator does that because they don't have the stamina all the other big predators have to hunt quickly and and take down their prey or hunt the weak hyenas are just like we're just going to follow you for a day how about tomorrow we're going to keep going and they will hunt you into the ground till finally like a wildebeest will just drop of exhaustion and then they just roll up and they're like hey we're here to rip your guts out uh, snack time is on. And they have the highest, like, bite, uh, like, pounds per, sp- uh, you know, pressure One per square highest, inch of, I think, of, I think of, of any animal, yeah, of any land animal ever. And that's the sort of shit, like, what you're talking about right now is what started, like, I was a biology major in college, and that's what scared the Shoot. shit out of me, because I just kept thinking about in, in like reflecting now, I'm thinking about like the hyenas being the pet of the Joker in the animated Batman series, them being yeah. in different Disney movies as villains, them, you know, you never see them in a positive light. And I'm sure that all of that no. and being a zoologist, like I shouldn't be scared of animals, any of them, but like hammerhead sharks and hyenas, maybe it's just all animals with age. <laughs> horses are a little irritating, but I'm not really scared of, of them. <laughs> no, not I'm not scared of horses, but they are. Hyenas are bad. They, they'll fuck you up. Hummingbirds? Hummingbirds are assholes. They're okay, liars and thieves. I want to know why we think they're so cool, because I lived in L.A. in an apartment with a tree that attracted those little fucking sons of bitches, and these cocksuckers would come at, like, four in the morning <laughs> and do their I Want to Fuck song, and it was annoying and clackety and loud, and my roommate and I would just, like, we'd be in the hall at 4.45 a.m. going, what the fuck? And everyone's yeah. like, hummingbirds. I'm like, no, no, you come and observe them at 4 a.m. when you're trying to fucking sleep. Fuck hummingbirds. Or for hummingbirds, fucking. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck hummingbird sex. What a buzz killer. So I, I kept hearing about your, your stage performance, Hyena, and I really wanted to go, but you did it in cities where I wasn't. Can you tell us a little bit about, <laughs> like, what that was, how that manifested, your collaboration with 
Georg, yeah. otherwise known as Herr Meister. Herr Meister. Mm -hmm. had to anonymize himself before he came out. See, what happened was I had done this story as a at a storytelling event at the Porchlight Storytelling Series in San Francisco. And I did so sort of as a dare to myself because I was challenged to tell a story that was not necessarily about sex. And I had done a lot of sort of sexy, raunchy, fun storytelling, but I hadn't done any storytelling that went into other areas of my life. And the the people organizing, and I think it was Beth Lissick, had called me and said, well, what do you want to talk about? And immediately in my head was the voice, well, what you don't want to talk about is that time you went crazy in rehab and started talking to a hyena. And I was like, where did that come from? And then that immediately indicated that that's exactly what I had to talk about. <laughs> and I was petrified to do so. I was like, I don't... I don't want to get on stage and talk about what probably amounts to a, a, a psychotic break. It was never diagnosed as such because every therapist I spoke to lied to me and told Aww. me I didn't need medication. <laughs> Aww. I did. I wanted to take pills so bad. I just wanted someone to give me a pill and then wake up and it would be gone. Right. Uh, or she would be gone because her name was Bubbles, appropriately. And, um, and so that was the first thing she said is actually like erupted from the floor and was like, hi, I'm Bubbles. I was like, wow. this is not, not acceptable at all. <laughs> On any level, is this a thing I want in my life? And so I told this story, and after I got off stage, I, I, my, my, my slot was right before the break in the storytelling event. And so I got off stage, and it was intermission, and I never even made it back to my seat because people literally ran up to me to say, Oh my God, I have a demon too. Or, Oh my God, my brother, my cousin, my sister, my aunt, my uncle, my best friend, everyone had a story of addiction. Everyone either was in recovery from or knew someone who was in recovery from or knew someone who should be in recovery and who was not. And I realized how profound it was to share this particular story because we don't talk about addiction very much um, in, in casual conversation. I, I never found it really came up. And once I was on the other side of that of that firewalk, I realized that it was so, so much a permanent part of who we were. And then I started talking about it more. And I was on the um, someone from the uh, uh, Snap Judgment podcast was in the house that day. And she said, um, a woman named Julia, who was amazing, said, hey, would you be interested in coming on Snap Judgment and telling the story? And as an NPR nerd, I was like, bing, bing. So there was a version of it recorded for NPR, and Georg had heard this and was very moved by it and said, you know, this would make an amazing theater piece. And I had always had the idea that it would make a really cool comic book. Ooh, that would be cool. Which actually is a thing I'm starting to work on right now, which I'm very excited, but it's in the very early stages of, like, I found an, an illustrator I love, and I'm going to work with her, I hope, um, to do it. Uh, another black woman illustrator. And I'm like, this is perfect. <sighs> nice. So he loved it so much. And what was fascinating is that it took him a little bit to get someone to agree to commission it. The first people he approached were like, oh, um, how about this other thing? <laughs> were they like, this is weird? I mean, what was... There's two things. I think uh, commissioners tend to be very cautious about what they're presenting generally. Then the second thing is there's a history of artists dragging their wives into miserable collaborations that suck awfully. <laughs> oh, they didn't realize how fabulous you were. No, no one right. knew. And so, and then I was mad. I was like, do they know who I am? I'm amazing. <laughs> and he was like, they all know soon, darling. And I was like, fine. And then delightfully, the folks who run the Wien Modern Festival, which is specifically a festival of new contemporary modern music in Vienna, was like, hell yeah, we'll do it. Of course, this is exactly what we want to do. And so my my premiere was was on stage in Vienna in like concert halls where like Beethoven shit premiered and it was amazing. Wow. And for me to be on stage being like, I grew up in the fucking projects, poor as hell, you know, living in tenements. And now I'm on stage in the middle of Vienna talking about pissing in the bed because I was so drunk and wow. talked to an, a fucking hyena. And then, you know, and then doing it at another music festival in northern England and then doing it in New York. And it's 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 amazing because, 
you realize that the more specific and personal your story is, the more universal it becomes. Yes. People will find a way to relate to it. Even people who've like, who aren't alcoholics at all. Like Georg has never been an alcoholic. He, he doesn't drink at all, but he relates to it in terms of that voice that tells you that you're no good, that tries to pull you apart. You know, so many of us struggle with that. For some people, the, the hyena is depression. For some people, the hyena is a bad relationship, whatever it is. It's so human to have that part of you that you despise. Mm-hmm. And it's so human to to feel terrified at the idea of trying to find a way to reconcile with it. And this story, as it's told now, sort of ends as I'm leaving rehab. And then, you know, and I was like, I, I, I don't know if this is an OK place to end. And Georg said, well, obviously the story has a happy ending because you're standing here telling it. Yeah. And wow. I was like, oh. <laughs> oh, I'm like getting all chills, you know? And so I wrote this essentially what's a libretto, I guess. And I was like, I wrote a libretto and then gave it to him. And he just did his like musical genius poops all over it. <laughs> and then uh, we fucking did it. I want to get into your relationship with him. And there's a whole, like, listeners listening, there's a whole lot of interesting layers to your relationship. But first, before we get into that, because I know it's going to be a very in-depth thing, I want to thank you for something. I First of all, I completely think the world of you. Like, you're amazing. You have, just by being friends with you and seeing things you post on Facebook, you have contributed so many little valuable nuggets to my life. I don't know if you realize how many valuable nuggets you contribute, I'm sure, to lots of people's lives. And one of the most recent that has made me feel just like, I'm not a weirdo, I'm not an asshole, (laughs) and I have a right to feel this, is your no advice, please, hashtag. (laughs) I cannot tell you how, and I think you and I are very similar. Like I, I don't have a temper. I normally do not get mad at people. It is very rare that I get like the red face and the, the one thing is when I'm like, Hey, like I'm just on Facebook and I want to complain like, ow, my finger hurts. Feel sorry for me because it's my Facebook and I can be the center of attention. And someone's like, get some coconut oil and then some raw (laughs) onions and scotch tape them to your feet. And I'm like, fuck yourself. I hate you. (laughs) So then I saw your no advice, please hashtag, which I use. I've co-opted that. Yes. I've seen it spreading. I'm so proud. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Tell me about like why you started with the no advice, please, and why no advice, please, is a really good thing for people to adhere to, not just on Facebook. In but general? Like, in, in general, life. yes. You know, the, the, it started because I uh, had, I went into the doctor, and the doctor's like, yeah, your blood sugar is not good. And I was like, oh, man, diabetes. But I never had any symptoms. And, you know, the doctor, thank God, let me just sidebar, was not one of these people who's like, you're fat, that's why you're fucked up. He basically was like, well, you know, if you lose, they say if you lose 10% of your body weight, it can help with this. So I, I, I lost like 10 pounds and I started walking and I stopped drinking juice and, and soda all day and all night. And I just reduced how much sugar I ate. And now my blood sugar is normal and I'm still fat and otherwise I'm awesome. So I was like, this is great. And as I started posting about it, suddenly everybody had some shit to say. Oh. And I was like, and the thing is, and I'm going to be super arrogant for a minute I'm really smart I have paperwork to prove it thank you and you are and I feel the same way I'm like it's insulting like do you think I'm an idiot like like like, first of all I said second of all do you think I don't utilize the internet do you think I don't utilize my incredible network of friends I said you need to understand I know three neurosurgeons off of the top of my head I have a friend who I went to high school with who's an endocrinologist, and she's also an African-American woman, who she is the person I'm going to fucking text if I need advice about my diabetes diagnosis. But, 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 Melina, Melina, no, (laughs) no, because my sister-in-law's cousin's husband's little nephew (laughs) took vitamin B12 and cured his diabetes. That's what's going to work for you. Diabetes. (laughs) Part of what aggravated me was was the thing that because of my politeness and because of the way I try to conduct myself on social media, when someone would say something that I already bloody knew 
or I knew to not be correct or I knew didn't work for me, I felt compelled to say, okay, yes, but oh, yes, okay, I tried that or no, that won't work for me or blah, 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 whatever. And so I found myself engaging in ways that I did not want. And life is too short to deal with that. And I found myself getting lots of advice that was bullshit. And the other thing is I feel like my page is something that I have to curate. I don't want other folks coming there reading the shit that someone else has said and then going off unbeknownst and following advice that maybe isn't isn't accurate. And I know that everyone's responsible for themselves, but part of me felt like I could try to curb that ongoing like thing I read on the internet thing that Melina passively endorsed because she didn't say stop talking about that. <laughs> so I, I just finally said, you know, I actually really don't want advice. And then the thing that really drove it home was that no matter how many times I said, hey, I'm not looking for advice. I just want to blah, blah, blah. People ignored it. Like people would say, I know you, people would literally, and to this day, it happened last week. I know you don't like advice, but, and to me, this becomes a boundary violation. And it's sort of, I, I use it now as a, as an underscoring of an example of how hard it is to maintain even a simple social boundary. And this is part of the thing I think people don't understand is when a simple social boundary can't be respected, how much is it more, how much more difficult is it when serious shit goes down to have your boundaries respected? And I think it gives people the opportunity to take a deep breath and say, well, wait a second, my giving advice is really a way for me to feel smart and me to feel helpful. Like I've done something. And I know how high it, it, how high you can get off of doing shit for other people. It's the main thing that motivates me as someone who identifies as submissive is I love doing shit for other people. But I get their permission first. I'm involved in a power exchange dynamic because I love doing shit for people. And specifically for one person when I can see the benefit to my work. I love that. I'm addicted to it. I love being able to run shit and then at the end of the day say, look at this shit I ran, and have someone go, look at the shit you ran. It was amazing. So I get that. But the fact that it's not consensual makes me a little bit nuts. And, and yeah, and the idea that you think I'm too stupid to figure this shit out myself, I know that's not what people are thinking, but that's my reaction to it. And in order for me to prevent lashing out with verbal violence online, I'm just like, you know what? Save everyone the trouble. Just don't give me advice unless I ask for it. And when I do ask for advice, holy shit, I get shit tons of it. <laughs> so I have a question here, and this is me playing blue-eyed devil advocate. Don't Okay, don't devil's advocate. See, that's on the derailing list, Ken. You, <laughs> <laughs> you did the thing, white man. You did the right, thing. I'm going to insert a sound effect right here like the game show buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> and that is when you say POC only and white people start to comment on it. And that's my devil advocate thing. Can you give us a brief comment as to why white people comment when you ask them not to? Yeah. You know, what's interesting is that when I wrote that post, as I hit send, I actually reopened it to amend it because I was like, oh, my God, a bunch of white people are going to respond. And then I said, no, leave it. It's clear. Right. It's clear. You don't have to make a big thing out of it. I didn't want to. I was like, don't insult your readers. You've made it clear it's at the very beginning of the post. You open right. with it. Let me ask. POC only. Then proceeded with the question. Yeah. Um. And, and, and to be honest, I didn't use the word only. But you said, hey, POC. Which to me is direct enough. But apparently it wasn't. And then as I'm reading it, I realized that I sort of did that typical head shake where I'm like, of course, white people responded. On the other hand, it was good for me to see that white people were like, oh, yeah, I actually do that as well. I'm aware that this is uh, the, the, the perception that people of color are always the criminals is a problem. What was the exact question that you asked in your post? It was the morning that this horrific massacre occurred in Las Vegas. And when I open one eye, of course, my hand is, is on my, my New York Times briefing and I'm seeing all these posts and it was like shooter kills at the time it was something like 30 something people and i said please god don't let it be a black or a brown person or even worse like a muslim extremist uh -huh. and then i scrolled down and then i said okay thank god it's a white guy and i'm like oh my god i wonder if all like brown people do this <laughs> they just sit there going please don't let it be one of us yeah please please and and knowing that first of all that type of violence is almost never perpetrated by people of color it's not that's not our mo we tend to to destroy ourselves in paroxysms of of self-loathing 
of course, sponsored by, you know, hundreds of years of genocide and slavery right. and deliberate underclassism and all sorts of nasty, terrible things that make people hate themselves. And so I, I asked a question. I was like, hey, POC, do you also breathe a sigh of relief, a weird, ironic sort of situation, when you see that someone who's done something fucked up, you know, the, the newest active shooter situation is not a person of color. And of course, like some people of color did. And then someone was like, well, I'm white, but I do that too, because I know that this is a natural outcome. And I was like, uh. so the level of aggravation was not profound. Like I did not rip anybody. I didn't like put, I didn't even put little like frowny icons on any white people who responded. <laughs> like I was totally like, okay, I'm observing this. And then I asked a follow-up question. I was like, hey, white folks, why is it that you do feel like it's compelled to ask this question? Again, not in a obnoxious or aggressive or even, which would have been justified, frustrated way. Right. You know, it was straight up like, what is what is the psychology behind this? And then as I posted that, I was like, okay, black people and brown people are going to respond. And then some white person is going to be like, oh, look, a brown person responded when you asked for white people only. And I was like, and did course, they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <gasps> oh, yeah. I missed that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I was like, I couldn't even break it down for them. I just said, hey, you know, so if this was your response to it, sigh. Like, I just left it at that. I was just like, you know, I just, I became my mom for a moment and just gave them the look. I was like, oh, dear. Oh, dear. Okay. Okay. I, I, I see what's going on here. But I, I did not. I was like, you know what? You need to understand that someone explaining to you why what you did hurt is not the same as you explaining to us why what you did hurt see what i'm saying like there's a right there's a gap there there's also the whole punching up versus punching down theory but i don't want to get too deep i had to like get georg out of the house into europe so i was like i got shit to do i can't <laughs> busy over here slaving doing my slave right shit. so you know i didn't go into depth but i appreciate when people say it makes a difference because so often i feel like i'm shouting into a well in the dark in a basement like you know, like, I'm the chicken silence of the lands at the bottom of the well. Like, hey, racism is bad, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, I see everything that you talk about and post about on Facebook. And thank you for, like, do that's fucking exhausting. And thank you for, for doing the work that you do. Thanks, dude. Yeah. So you had mentioned, oh, you, what? Hold on. It puts the lotion on its skin. <laughs> <laughs> You this had like mentioned one of the creepier analogies I've made in the past <laughs> six months. <laughs> you ever feel like the girl in the well in the basement in Slimes of the Lands when you're talking to white people about racism? Do you ever feel like that? Oh. <laughs> so you had mentioned just a minute ago about getting Gay Arg off to Europe. So that's what I want to talk about after the break. You are in a a very I don't know. It's a it's a relationship that came at kind of a surprise, I think, to you at this point in your life. And Georg had an interesting upbringing in Austria, where you are an African American woman raised in New York. So there's a lot there to break down. We're gonna take a break, so and then much. we're gonna talk about that. I know you're fancy, and I know you've been eyeing some of those luxury sex toys, haven't you, you frisky little fox? Well, I also know that you enjoy a good discount, don't you, dear? You now can get 20% off your entire order, plus free shipping, at luxury sex toy retailer Lalo.com with discount code SUNNY. Yes, dear, you heard me right. 20% off anything, your little heart, or, well, <clears throat> other parts desire at l-e-l-o dot com using discount code s-u-n-n-y yes dear you can thank me later hey everybody it's irony here to tell you about a show my friend ivan and i host called fetish world podcast we discuss all manner of things that are kinky and taboo topics ranging from my love of gangbang porn to rubbing ghost pepper oil on your urethra so come join us every week as we dive deep and explore awesome fetishes with fun guests you may even learn a new kinky word and you can find us on any of your favorite podcast listening apps at fetish world podcast bye, bye. 
Castle Megastore. Once you see their sex toys, you'll want more. I have no idea if Castle Megastore actually has a theme song, but I really dig Castle Megastore. So that's my gift to you, Castle, your very own theme song. And you, listeners, get a gift, too, if you go to CastleMegastore.com and use discount code SUNNY, that's S-U-N-N-Y, when you check out, you will receive 20% off your order. That's amazing! Castle Megastore. When you get your sex toys, you'll be on the floor because you'll be using them so much and they'll be so awesome and you'll save so much money, you'll get more than one and then you'll climax for a really long time and you'll just be passed out and you'll be like, oh my god, give me water, there's the best orgasm ever. All right, so this this is this is gonna be a story, Melina. Wah wah. So you met your husband what, like three years ago, right? Four years ago this four December. Years. Oh, time goes by so fast. It's not it's even been funny. Four years. Oh my goodness. So tell us the story because this is a this is a whole lot of whole lot of layers, a whole lot of peel back this onion for us. Yeah, we'll do the condensed version. So the first part of it is that I have been involved in the kink and leather and BDSM communities since the mid 90s actively and that whole time looking for a partner dominant partner and specifically one I could be in like a really cool power exchange dynamic with and I'd had several relationships I think the longest of which though was maybe two years a little over that and I never found exactly the right fit but you know I'm I'm stupid and hopeful and and also I knew this is what I really wanted and as my life sort of proceeded and as I realized that I was not finding the right person and then I finally got sober and then spent the next few years wondering, okay, now I'm sober and I'm getting my life together and now will I find someone I never did? And I had spent a few years working on the website for alt.com and bondage.com. It used to be owned by Friend Finder Networks and then it got bought out by fucking penthouse and it became a horrible place to work but i made a shit ton of money and so i decided i was going to take this shit ton of money that i'd saved and go into the world and become like a sex educator and do all this awesome work and wasn't it going to be great and then what i realized was that three years later i was through uh, a lot of my savings mm-hmm. and had not and had discovered that it was really a struggle and and also found out that the people who seemed to be doing well and surviving and even thriving as sex educators, each and every one of them had a partner with a lucrative, quote unquote, normal job. Right. Or or it's just all really good PR, baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> After we're done with you, we're going to go eat our ramen noodles. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, no one is actually doing this successfully on their own, making a living. It's just it's not it's not feasible. And that sort of hit me, and I said, well, okay, I guess you know, what I have to do is just is buckle down and get uh, a job and, and do that thing. And so in early December of, of 2013, I, was, I took a shower in the dark, because this is one of my favorite things to do since I'm a kid, is like get in the bathtub and then turn on the shower and then turn off the lights. So you can pretend like you're having a shower in the jungle in the dark. I don't know why this is exciting to me, but it is. I would be terrified. That might be my hyena (laughs) right there. Like psycho, like here comes Norman Bates, you know? (laughs) But the light was on when he stabbed her in the shower. True, true. But I don't, it's just scary. And, scary. and, and, And I totally get it. It doesn't work for everyone, but it's one of my things. And so I had one of these sort of conversations with the universe and I was like, you know, I have done so much to get my shit together. I have been brave and I have left into the void. Like I moved from San Francisco back home to New York, courtesy of, you know, my two friends, the evil Jewish lesbian landladies who offered me a reasonably priced room in New York City, which never happens. Uh, so they made it possible for me to come home, but I was living in like a massive, huge rent controlled apartment in the mission in San Francisco. I have this amazing job and everyone's like, you are an idiot to fucking leave this. And I said, well, you know, here's the thing. I could lose that job tomorrow and this apartment isn't mine. I can't stay somewhere, uh, based on someone else's goodwill when I know that what I need to do is, is be back home. And so I was at the point where my financial breaking point had happened and I said, look, I'm going to take this shower and communicate with the universe. And I was like, you know, I did all the shit I'm supposed to do. I trusted 
in fate and I trusted in myself and I actualized and visualized and I'm and I'm I'm at the end of my sort of fantasy period here. I was like, so starting January first, I will go back because I worked for many years doing corporate bullshit, uh, mm-hmm. financial institutions. So I have a, a fat, juicy, shiny resume there that would get me into middle management at pretty much any bank or financial place, whatever. It's like I can go and do that and make a good living, and 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 just do the stuff and 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 whatever. It's great fun. That's what I'm going to do starting January 1st uh, because I give up. I'm tired, and I need to be rational. And and when I say give up, I don't mean give up on life. I mean give up on this silly fantasy and go and be successful in a different way. Right. And uh, and, and I can do that. You know, I'm, I'm in my 40s, but uh, uh, people have certainly remade themselves later than that. And I'm like, maybe I'll go back to school. Maybe I'll go to city college and whatever. I said, so this is what I'm going to do. Unless, of course, in the next three weeks, you somehow magically send me the perfect person who is going to, like, take care of me and and do all the shit. And then I have this amazing life. Uh, You know, dot, 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 which is, of course, not going to happen. And it did. And it fucking did, right? Like, a week later, I get a uh, message on OkCupid, of all places, where I have uh, a profile that is just my regular kink profile, like, hey, I'm kinky and I'm submissive, and no, that doesn't mean you just get to walk up and put your dick in my mouth or sit on my face. That's not how it works. (laughs) And then I had been doing this for, like, a couple years and had had a couple of dates but no success um, in terms of a real connection with anyone. And then I got this lovely message from this man and went on a date and... Basically, it was like, okay, this is strangely perfect, even though it seems wildly not perfect. I was like, this guy is, you know, freshly moved to to New York. He's a Columbia professor. I had to do the thing. Like, if you live in a big city, if you're a city kid, like, I had to walk into his, like, beautiful two-bedroom apartment, like, essentially a penthouse apartment overlooking the river and go like, don't fall in love with the apartment, girl. Don't fall in love with the apartment. <laughs> Cause I was like, there's two, there's two full baths here. I was like, I don't care if I don't care who this man is. I'm like I'm moving in. I'm wearing, I was like, no, 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 no. Can't don't figure out if he's cool. <laughs> then move in the apartment. But like, seriously, like on our second date, he laid out this contract for a, an MS relationship. And I was like, who the fuck are you? He had, Almost no experience, and and he was concerned that this would be an issue for me, and I said to myself, actually, no, this is kind of great. I have enough experience to know what I'm looking for. He has the desire to 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 step into that role for himself, but none of the spoilers that come from being a a a cisgendered male in the kink communities and the leather communities, which tends to breed some really unpleasant creatures. I'm Domly McDomlington. No, I mean, dude, this guy was like, okay, so I really want you to be my slave full time. And I understand that that has a financial requirement there. And I understand that you apparently don't have health care here. What's that about? What's wrong with your country? But whatever. So I will make sure that you, you know, have your health care taken care of, that your dental stuff is taken care of because you know i think like the day before my teeth were so terrible i just was like uh everything is falling out of my head he's like we'll take care of that i'll make sure that you have a certain amount of money put aside every month for you um you know we'll work out how much that is and you will have control of it it will not be something that i can take from you so that you know as our relationship proceeds if things don't work out at least you have a buffer going back in and i was just like jesus christ what what? Where did you come from? And I like you. No one does that. And he was, he, and he was just so, and he, he, you know, he was a little older than me. I was like, ah, oh, he's like 16 years older than me, but he's got like the, 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 the energy and passion of is that he contains is just really very timeless. And the fact that he was also an artist was great for me. Um, I, I really didn't see how my own artistic pursuit was going to fit into this lifestyle because if you're doing plays, you can't gallivant off to Europe every other week. You have to be in one place for a while, which is tough with our lifestyle. So I said, well, I don't know how that's going to work out, but you know, I can do little things here and there. I can maybe do a showcase or we'll figure it out. You know, and I, again, I, I left that up to, up to fate and to chance and, and up to 
trusting that this was the right thing. And it turned out to not just be the right thing, but to be the right thing in amazing ways that I had never even conceived of. You know, it went beyond my having room to go and audition for stuff. It's like we are creating our own works. And right. so 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 that's what happened. And uh, yeah, so this December will mark the fourth year that we've been together. When we first met, he was uh, just in the process of extricating himself from his third marriage. <laughs> and so he was like, I will never marry again. And I was like, dude, you should not. Clearly, you don't do that very well. And here you are married. I know, which is funny. And I was completely like, you know, you say you're fine with the thing, but then you're not. Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, 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 that's cool. And then part of you is like, no, 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 fuck that shit. But genuinely, I said, you know, if I get an MS relationship, MS being master slave, or a power exchange relationship out of this for, with someone who loves me and cares for me, and I get to travel the world and take care of him and make his house a home, and it's like the paper, the marriage thing doesn't even matter. Like, this is more what I want. Right. And so I genuinely was on the same page with him in, in, in terms of that. You know, I said, I don't need to be Mrs. Haas the fourth. <laughs> right, right. To have a wonderful life at all. You know, that wasn't that that wasn't what I was seeking. And then of course he changed his mind. So that part of it fell into into place as well, you know. Aww. So when people hear about your relationship, now you're in a master slave relationship, sometimes, you know, people get a little give you a little shit about like, you're a black woman in a master slave relationship, which is one subject, but you're also in a master slave relationship with a man who's Austrian. Yeah. Who was raised by people who had who were Nazis, basically, right? So tell us about that. Like, how is that all? Well, you know, it's work? interesting because I, I actually don't often use the term master slave outside of, of 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 my own circle who know what that means. And I will say, owner property are dominant and submissive um, because owner property is more in line with our dynamic. I think a lot of people assume that a slave is someone who functions at the whim of the other person and, and, and has been broken by them. Uh, whereas our relationship is, is when people see us together, they actually assume 90% of the time that I'm the dominant because I am constantly like running around like, sir, you need to do this. Sir, you need to do that. What are you doing? Why aren't you over here? Blah, 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 blah. But you know? I mean, you it, really, that's true. You're like his support. Like you have all the shit together. You have him going to places when he needs to go and eating when he needs to eat and sleeping <laughs> when he has to sleep. Like you really are, you know, he, he basically is, I don't know the way I look at it. He's the master in like Molina tell me what to do and keep me together. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it's, that's what you do. There's a meta And show me the boobs. Show me the boobs. Yes. There is the, the, the boob service. Um, the meta order is take care of my entire life and make it awesome. And what that looks like, he does not care. There are some people for whom protocol is important. And so they, they, they focus on that aspect of the relationship. There are some people for whom specific sets of actions or demonstrative of uh, words or deeds or kneeling or, you know, whatever uh, are part of their protocol. But that, that's just not how we work. That's not what he needs, you know. Right. Um, and he, you know, he's, he's, he was born in 1953 his 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 parents and his grandparents, you know, you can do the math and figure out how old they were when shit got real in Europe. And the reality is they were not on the side of right in, in history here. They just they just weren't, you know, and he would tell me stories of his grandmother waxing rhapsodic about the time she met the Fuhrer. Wow. And uh, yeah, and his and his his grandfather taking him to the uh, the places in in Graz, which was a, a it's the second or third largest city in, I think it's the third. It's Vienna, Salzburg, Graz, in in Austria. And the thing that the Austrians have managed to do is to make everyone forget that Hitler was Austrian. <laughs> like, like everyone's like Germany, Hitler, Germany. Hitler. Like no, 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 no. You guys, dude, motherfucker was from Austria, like from up the road from where Georg grew up. So he was their homeboy. Like when he rolled through during the annexation, um, the Austrians were cheering and throwing roses at his feet. They were stoked. Wow. And the irony is that you had people who, after the war, 
Germany was like reparations, mea culpa. Like to this day, there's no German who has not been raised going to the camps. And they take kids there like through their life. And the same way we go to fucking Great Adventure, they're like, and eh, we're going to a concentration camp kids so you can see how fucked up it is when people do fucked up shit. You know, when I was there uh, a year before, I think last year, um, visited one of the camps in Germany, and uh, they actually have a police training academy on the grounds so that the police are every day reminded of what happens when power goes wrong. Whoa. You know, and I was like, holy crap, oh my God, what? You know, and, and, and after the war, this is like, this is what Germany went through. Austria, after what was like, yeah, yeah, like, oh, past the green beans, everything's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no recognition, no, no mea culpa, no, nothing, nothing. Wow. And, 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 and it shows, you know, the, the, the right wing, like the right wing in Austria are Nazis. Like when you talk about Austrian politics, basically it goes from Republicans to Nazis. Like that's how it is. Like if you, if you look at the scale of what's happening in the U.S., and you, you shift it over one click, like that's how it is in Austria. Like even left wing people are just a little bit of a mess and a little conservative and kind of jacked up. And so this was the environment in which he was raised. And he, when he was in his early twenties, had this awakening, you know, due in part to um, his his life lifelong friend who is still his friend to this day, who sort of sat him down over the course of a couple of years when they were in, in school and explained to him that everything he had been taught was wrong. And uh, so he had been working on him. And then Georg met a woman who had lost uh, a son in the, in the camps. And when she told him that, and he was able to look in the eye of someone and feel that the reality of it, you know, he said his whole, the whole world fell away from him is how he described it. You know, and he knew that everything he had been taught was a lie. Because, of course, he was taught that the Holocaust didn't happen. Wow. That, like, you know, some, Unreal. People, some people died, but, you know, that's what happened in war. And actually, a lot of Austrians were, 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 were prisoners of war, and we died, too. You know, that's, that's what war is. There was, no, there was no admission that there was a systematic uh, extermination of millions of people. That just didn't happen. And so when he sat and, and, and that one person said, this is what happened to me, it's a lot easier to understand that and then from there to to let your understanding grow. When someone says six million people, like you can't picture that. Right. But you can sit over tea in the living room and see the, the, the pain and feel this woman say that she lost her child. And then he started doing his own research and realized that not just was everything he knew a lie, that uh, you know, his grandparents who actually provided for him the only safe space in his life and who went against his parents to help him study music were Nazis, right? Like they perpetrated this evil. They were the people who brought these guys into power. They were the people who sent their sons off to war, you know, their sons being again, you know, Georg's father. And so it was, it was kind of stunning to have this person go from that upbringing and 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 all the damage that comes with it you know uh to then saying i actually will spend the rest of my life creating art that goes against fascism you know because one of the stories he tells was that he realized he could not be fascist when he heard the music of philip glass he was like you can't love philip glass and be a fascist and i was like what <laughs> he said you need to understand, like, what when you look at, at, at fascism, there's no creativity, there's no individuality, there's no, there's nothing new, there's no new thinking, there's no creative impulse that's honored and respected. When you look at quote unquote art from that era, it's horrible, it's soulless and creepy, because the whole purpose of art is to uplift the state. Right. It's not to 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 have you feel good about yourself. It's not to take you on an emotional journey. It's not to show you something that you've never felt before. It's to remove everything that you love except the fear and the state and 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 honor and and your country and your race. And that's not art. That's that's art being used as a horrible tool. And he was like, I'm, I can't be that. That's not who I am. So yeah. So he had that was part of his life's journey was figuring out how to go back and and really see the truth and then also learn how to let go of the destructive guilt that he had, you know, the terrible fear that he was somehow also a part of this legacy, 
you know, and so this just really fascinated me. And I never forget on our first date, he he actually didn't tell me all these details on the first date. Like this sort of got teased out over the next few months. I was talking to him about mentioned something about, you know, racism. And he was like, oh, yes, it really is a problem here. And I was like, yeah, kind of. You know, I said, there's no there's no brown child in America that doesn't know or hasn't been subjected to racism before you know, after the age of 12, we all have this experience as small children. He's like, you were a small child and and racism happened. And I told him the story about being on the, on, in the sandbox, literally like on the upper East side, playing with this little girl who, whose mother came over and yanked her away. And then she came back to get her toys and said, I can't play with you anymore. My mommy says I'm not allowed to play with niggers. And I had never even heard the word. I was like, for. But like I knew, like my my, I will never forget that sensation of knowing that something is bad, but not knowing why. And I go crying to my mom. My mom is like freaks out, and, you know, et cetera. And, and as I'm relaying this to Georg, like I can just see he's like he's 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 tearing up. He's like horrified and he's like about to cry. And I'm like, oh my god, dude. It's like it's like some, some like sixty year old old Austrian dude. It's like reduced to tears because of racism against a little kid. I was like, this guy's got something interesting going on. All right, let's yeah. see. let's see what's going on. Wow. And then of course, you know, there was like hours of of crazy pussy eating because he's got like a thing for that. And I was like, all right, he's empathetic. Oh, you picked a good yeah, one. Yeah. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 If you're gonna have someone be like super dedicated to a sex act, that's not the worst one to, to have. High five Thank you. through the Skype. <laughs> totally. <laughs> So we're coming near, coming up to the end of our time together, which is sad because there's so much to talk about. But there's one thing I want to touch on a, as we go is now I know with the relationship with you and Herr Meister, he was not kinky. He suppressed his kinkiness and then finally came out publicly as kinky, which was a big evolution. Yeah. And I know, you know, you've talked about his dealings with politics and dealing with racism and you know the 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 trauma of growing up in a family that racism was so prevalent and and nazism and whatnot so i had a question that came to me on a youtube comment which the youtube comments are like the dregs of the internet i don't even know why i read them but we did an episode uh, a few weeks ago with cooper beckett from life on the swing set and it was the politics of swinging and someone's like what the fuck does politics have to do with sex? And I was like, what? so I think that's a good question for you. What the fuck does politics have to do with sex, well, Melina? The thing is that politics has to do with how we live in society, right? And I, the th I'm always flabbergasted by this. It's difficult for me to answer because it, it, it seems like it's like, what's the deal with oxygen and staying alive? Why do we care about the air? <laughs> Like, what the fuck? Like, that's how ridiculous this question seems to me. I'm like, ah, you know, so so my thing is, it's like, look, how we live our lives is in part for people living in any sort of, especially in Western society, dedicated by our political systems. And if you look at our sexuality and you look at sex, it's absolutely 100% a part of who we are. And it's really critical. If you look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which, you know, it's not the be all and end all. But I find it very interesting that in there, along with food and socialization, sex is there twice. Once as a reproductive function and once as a social and pleasure function. Nothing else appears there twice. Food doesn't appear there twice. You know, so the idea that you need a gourmet meal in order to have a quality of life is is does not exist. The idea that you need to have sex and, and, and intimate relationships relating to them as part of your necessity is also is also critical. And that counts as well if you are someone who does who identifies as asexual. It means that your choice is that you choose not to engage sexually. And that is also a political choice because it impacts your life. Right. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's what that's what political politicalness is. So everyone is included in that from the person who is like the most delicious, horniest slut dog to the person who is an, an ascetic. Like everyone has to deal with their sexuality regardless. And and so part of what makes it political is that those of us who have chosen a model of relating that does not fit into what our political system fosters are committing a radical act already. 
So, of course, polyamory falls into that purview because you can't marry three people if you love them. You know, you can't put three people uh, 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 as your spouse on any form anywhere. Right. And that's political. You know, you can leave people in your will if you die. But if you're in the hospital and you want your husband, your girlfriend and your lover to be there next to you, you can't have that. So those are things that do impact your politics. It's why I can't I can't see how you would separate those things. Let's say Georg and I had decided that we did not want to get married, but that our owner property bond was what was critical to us. I would not be able to walk into a hotel room and say, I'm his slave. I need to see him. It's not recognized. And and fair enough. You know, we don't want slavery to, to become a thing that's normalized because in, in the context of actual non-consensual chattel slavery, that's bad. Right. But, consensual, you know, uh, sexual slavery is a different flavor. It's about choice. And it's not dependent on, on, on my race or gender or creed or any of those things. It's dependent on two people or five people or however many people deciding that's what they want. So, of course, it is political. And what's what's difficult for me is when the politics don't align with an easy-to-digest message. You know, it's it's difficult for people to wrap their brains around the fact that you can be submissive and a feminist, that you can be um, a feminist and uh, own somebody and say, like, well, those things are, are, are completely diametrically opposed. And I'm like, no, because we're doing these things consensually and we're actualizing who we are. And that's really what any feminist thought is about. It's about saying it's not about my being a woman, in quotes, that dictates who I am. It's about my making a choice. And so politics are all up ons when it comes to that shit. Like you can't, you can't tease it apart and you shouldn't. There's no, there's no reason to, you know, of course it's political. Of course it is. Everything about being a black woman in America is, is both politicized and, and examined and reexamined and ignored and disempowered and empowered. There's, there's, there's dichotomies there. There's conflict everywhere. So when people are like, well, I don't understand how you can be X and Y, it's like you don't understand how you can love someone one minute and want to rip their head off the next. Surely you have felt that emotion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, she totally you know, just stared at me when she said that. <laughs> <laughs> that is our state of being multiple times a day. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's, that's conflict is human. Mm-hmm. You know, like interior dichotomies are what it means to be a, a living human being, to feel one thing and then immediately feel something that seems the polar opposite. And that's why politics have to be a part of our sexuality. You know, we're, we're having to fight for reproductive justice, for God's sake, in 2017. How is that not political? The, you know, like, the, 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 ah, sorry, I just... Uh, I'm with you. I'm with <laughs> you on all of this. And it's like, I could not have said all of that in, like, a YouTube comment reply, nor could I have said it as eloquently. <laughs> so thank you. So person who left that comment on last week's whatever podcast, I hope you're listening to this because there's your answer. <laughs> I turn off comments on all of my shit. I'm just too tired of people coming to to roast me for some bullshit. I'm like, oh, you're nah, you're stupid. I'm next. Yeah, I've just employed the ignore. Like, I'm just like, I'm not answering you. I'm just gonna pretend I didn't see that comment and not even. Yeah, like la la la. No, no. <laughs> this has been an awesome conversation, and I'm sad that it's like it seems like just an instant has gone by, and her time is over. And I could probably we could probably have like a whole podcast series of just like the Melina podcast. We just interview Melina every week and learn something new. <laughs> that would be oh. a great way for me to have a podcast without actually doing it. Oh my god, I should totally do that. Ooh, like, someone else make the podcast, and I'm just perpetually the guest. The MoCast. Yes. Oh, my God. If anyone listening wants to do that, I would totally do that. Yes. Yes. (laughs) You produce it. You edit it. Yes. I just come in and talk and then I leave. Yeah. So the person listening who wants to do that, because there might be one out there, tell us where they and everyone else can find you and all that fun stuff. The best way to find me is on Facebook. Uh, I'm Molina, M-O-L-L-E-N-A, Lee, L-E-E, Williams, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, Haas, H-A-A-S. If you start looking for Molina, I'm the first one that comes up. I seem to have, I seem to have beaten back all the other Molinas. 
the latecomers. Nice. Um, I also I also have a, a, a website, Molina.com. That's, again, M-O-L-L-E-N-A. And I'm on Twitter. And if you're one of those freaky, kinky people and you use FetLife, don't write me there. I never check that site anymore. I'm so... Amen. Because the oh, only messages okay. I get there is like, hi, I have a dick. Can I smell your feet? I'm like, no, <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's and I realized I didn't really need fet life for me personally anymore because I'm so out. Like, you know, if you're kinky and you want to find me, but you're not out, you can message me on Facebook and no one has to know. You know, I don't have to split my time there. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty, by much... the way, thank you for that. I'm exactly the same way. Like, yeah. and it's one of the reasons why like Sonny and I chose funny names on FetLife because I was just Ken for the longest time. I wasn't master Lord Lordington, Ken <laughs> Donleyville. <laughs> and somebody asked me my name at a conference once and I'm like, Ken, and this is at a BDSM conference. And I said, yeah. Ken, and they're like, no, no, what's your scene name? Ken. And so then I decided to use my Starbucks name, which was Lord Thunderpants. Nice. And that's how that whole thing started, was Lord Thunderpants was my Starbucks name. And I just I thought it was so that. freaking ridiculous. So, Mo, I really wanted to thank you for coming on today. Like, you are just so incredible. Thanks, you guys. Uh, you and, and please give our love and say hello to Herr Meister for us. I will do it. Yay. Thanks. Bye. Kids. Bye. Thanks for listening to American Sex. To keep up with Ken and I, we'll first make sure you watch our TV show, Sex with Sunny Megatron, on Showtime. Then visit SunnyMegatron.com. There you can learn more about us, read our blog, peruse our workshop calendar, or hire us. For what? Well, either for private coaching, or to book us to teach at your event or university, or as sex and relationship writers for your publication. Oh, and don't forget, we're on social media, too. I'm the super social one, so you can find me as Sunny Megatron on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, my YouTube channel, and a bunch of other places. But if you want to get me on Snapchat, you got to look for Sunny underscore Megatron, and you can follow Ken on Twitter at at tag SciChicken. That's P-S-Y-C-H-I-C-K-E-N. Also, please support us by shopping with the affiliates and sponsors from our breaks. And if you contribute to our Patreon, we're going to love you forever. Well, we're going to love you forever anyway, but just shh, go with it. Lastly, if you like this broadcast, tell people about it. Tweet it, Facebook status it, and rate it on iTunes and other platforms. Thanks, friends. We'll see you next week on American Sex.